All right, we'll go ahead and get started though. Um, so before I get to your questions, just a brief kind of breakdown of what it is that you need to do, uh, what the exam is going to look like. So because this is a two chapter exam, we are going to be looking at things kind of in a condensed manner. So there's a lot of depth. There isn't a whole lot of content. Um, so, um, in total, this is an 86 point exam, you'll be graded out of 78. So there are eight bonus points kind of laying out there in the, the exam itself. There will be 16 multiple choice questions. Most of those questions are going to focus on concept rather than calculation. So knowing the definitions of things, knowing <clears throat> things like solubility rules. Um, those are the kinds of questions you can expect to see in that multiple choice section. It's not going to be calculate this, determine the limiting reactive of that. It, it's not going to be those kinds of things. The short answer section, that's where you're going to find that kind of thing. Um, now, I did give you some forewarnings today. One of those questions of those six is a nomenclature question. So, you want to make sure that you prepare yourself accordingly, and that shouldn't come out as a surprise. So, if you haven't been working on nomenclature, it might not be a bad idea to get in the lab and work out a couple of those deficiencies just as practice. Friday. <clears throat> now, as far as coverages go, um, on a chapter by chapter basis, yes, there is a nomenclature question. We've already discussed it. Chapter seven, which is module four, this is a relatively short chapter in terms of concepts. We're primarily talking about balancing equations. And we're talking about stoichiometry. You can apply stoichiometry to limiting reactants. You can apply stoichiometry to percent yields. But the, the, the overall gist of that module was stoichiometry. The bulk of the exam, as you can see, is going to be out of module five, which was um, formerly known as chapter eight. And the, the main reason for that is we spent twice as long, almost three times as long in that particular unit compared to the stoichiometry unit. Um, so there were lots of little pieces and parts to that. You had your concentration calculations. You had your solubility rules. You had to be able to apply those solubility rules to determine ionic and net ionic equations. Growing into that also are questions related to Bronsky theory. Um, on the quiz that you took yesterday, that was one of the things that some of you got a little bit tripped up on was identifying an acid by its action rather than by its formula. Um, as far as redox goes, being able to do the kinds of things that you were asked to do in today's proficiency being able to do the same kinds of things that you were asked to do in the quiz yesterday. Assign oxidation numbers, determine what's being oxidized, identify oxidizing and reducing agents. And then finally, calculations related to chemical reactions and solution. We're talking titrations, solution stoichiometry. So being able to apply those principles of stoichiometry with molarity or if we're in the situation where we are looking at the combination of two solutions using that titration equation to figure out things like concentration or volume without actually having to resort to doing stoichiometry fully. So this is the uh, equation sheet that you will be given. 
you'll also be given a periodic table. Um, now, key on this particular set of unit, um, really, it's just this equation right here. The titration equation is really the only equation that has relevance in either of these two units. So um, while this equation sheet might be comforting to know that if you get stuck, you have it, there isn't a whole lot here that you can use because most of the stuff on here is irrelevant to the, to the conversation. Any questions about format, form, what you need to bring with you, those kinds of things? So same rules as usual. Calculators have to be scientific. Um, if you can't get your hands on one that morning, go over to the learning lab and borrow one. As far as timing goes, timing will be exactly the same as with exam one. We will start promptly at 12. Um, at 12.50, I will call time and allow you five extra minutes to finish up if you need those five extra minutes. Um, at 12.55, I will be collecting everybody's stuff. Um, So let me open it up now to your questions. And um, let me see if there's anything I can answer for you to help you get going. Yeah, go ahead. So let's let's start out with a, a question like number 14 here in the practice test. So the, the, the question is what compound has iodine with an oxidation number of positive three? What you have to remember for oxidation numbers um, is If we're dealing with something that is ionic, and acids and bases qualify as ionic for these purposes, what we want to do is we want to take each of these and we want to split them into their ions. So for the periodic acid here, I'd have the hydrogen ion and I'd have the periodate ion. Those would be the two ions that I would be looking for. Now, for hydrogen ion, the oxidation state's pretty easy to see. Because since it's the only element and it has a charge, the oxidation state is its charge. So it's positive one. For anything else, we're going to have to use our general guidelines. And what we want to talk about is the primary rule is that the sum of all the oxidation numbers has to equal the overall charge. So I've got an iodine and I've got four oxygens and together that combination of numbers has to equal out to negative one. And this will always be the case when I'm um, evaluating oxidation numbers. If 
I have a polyatomic ion, or even if I have a covalent molecule, the sum of the oxidation numbers will always equal the charge. So if I have sulfur dioxide, the sulfur and the two oxygens have to equal zero because that's the charge on sulfur dioxide. In the case of periodate here, the iodine and the four oxygens have to equal negative one because that's the charge on periodate. So once we've established that part of it, where we've identified, okay, here are my two ions, here's how those ions break down. Now we start looking for patterns. And one of the things that we can always bank on is that for oxygen, oxygen is negative two. And so if I have iodine matched up with four negative twos, four times negative two is negative eight. So I minus eight is negative one. Iodine must be positive seven. I just solved the algebra problem to get to what it is I'm looking for. So that gave me iodine here. Iodine is positive seven, not positive three. So we know A is incorrect. But we can do the exact same thing with the next one. H plus, iodate, I plus three oxygens equals negative one. I plus three times negative two is equal to negative one. I minus six is equal to negative one. I is equal to positive five. So that doesn't match up either. I go to the next one. H plus. IO2 negative one. So hydrogen is still positive one. Now I have iodine plus two oxygens makes negative one. Each oxygen is negative two. So I minus four is equal to negative one. I would be positive three. So that's what I'm looking for. That's how I know that C is the correct answer. So the key to these really comes down to recognizing when we can use the periodic table and when we can't use the periodic table. So if I have an element by itself, if I have an ion, I can use the periodic table to figure out what it is. So if I've got potassium, I can look at the periodic table and say, okay, potassium is going to be positive one. For hydrogen, look at the periodic table, see that hydrogen is positive one. If I have fluorine, same thing, fluorine is going to be negative one. But if I have elements combined with each other, I have to look for common kind of trends. Those common trends are mostly electronegativity focused. And what they tell us is basically Hydrogen's positive one, chlorine's negative one, oxygen's negative two. And from there, I usually can do an algebra problem to figure out the rest. Yeah. Okay, so for answering questions like 15 and 16, The only way you can identify whether a species is a redox or not a redox is to assign oxidation numbers and see if the numbers change. 
if the numbers change, we know we're dealing with a redox reaction. If the numbers do not change, then we know that we're not dealing with a redox reaction. So the question here, what species is oxidized? Well, the only way to answer that question is to assign oxidation numbers. So what would the oxidation state on the copper be? How do you know that? By itself. And it's not charged. So copper is zero. What about the iron sulfate? What do I need to do? So first, I got to split it by iron. So I've got the iron on one side, the sulfate on the other. How do I know charges? Right, right. So this would normally be a place where we could go to the periodic table and look. But since iron's a transition metal, we can't go to the periodic table and look. What we have to rely on, and this is what Charles was doing, we have to rely on knowing what the other ion is. Since we know from experience that the sulfate's negative two, logically speaking, that means that the iron has to be positive two to match it. Because that's what the formula says. The formula says that the iron and the sulfate have the same charge because they're there in a one-to-one -one mixture. So since the iron is this, what is its oxidation state? Yeah, it's going to be the same as its charge. It's the only element in the species, so its charge has to match its oxidation. So iron's positive two here. Now what about the sulfate? Sulfate, we got to do the breakdown. Sulfur and four oxygens make negative two. Sulfur minus eight is negative two, so sulfur is positive six. Positive six on the sulfur, negative two on the oxygen. And this part's important because a lot of people make this mistake when they're assigning oxidation numbers. Instead of assigning individual atoms, they put up the total. So I, I see a number of cases where in a situation like this, I would see negative eight being given as the oxidation state of the oxygen instead of negative two. And the problem with that is oxidation numbers are always on a per atom basis. And if the number of atoms changes, then you could artificially be seeing changes in state that actually aren't there. Now on the flip side, we've got iron by itself here. So what's its oxidation state? It's going to be zero over here. And for the copper sulfate, we're going to do the same thing. It splits off into copper and into sulfate. We know already that sulfate's negative two. So what's the copper? It's positive two. And so what's the oxidation state on the copper? Positive two. And what are the oxidation states on sulfur and oxygen? Positive six and negative two. Since we have the same thing on both sides, we know that the oxidation states are going to be exactly the same on both sides. So now it just becomes a matter of, we know that the numbers are changing. Copper is going from zero to positive two. Iron's going from positive two to zero. So one of those two is being oxidized and the other is being reduced. Which one is which? So say 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 the not say the mnemonic out loud. Okay. 
I gave you two different ways of remembering oxidation and reduction. Okay? What does Leo do mean? Okay. Okay. So if I lose electrons, what's happening to my charge? It's increasing. It's getting more positive. Which one of these is getting more positive? Copper went from zero to positive two. It's getting more positive. Loss of electrons is oxidation. That's what we're seeing. Correct answer is A. Iron, on the other hand, iron is being reduced. As you can see, it's going from positive two to zero. So it's getting less positive more negative gain of electrons is reduction. So if the question were reversed and we were asked which species is reduced, then we would say that it's the iron. For a question like 16, similar kind of process. Now, this time we're dealing with covalent compounds instead of ionic compounds, but the idea is, is effectively the same. We assign oxidation numbers, and we use those oxidation numbers to figure out what is being changed, if anything's being changed. So if I start with nitrogen dioxide, with nitrogen dioxide, I've got NO2, which has no charge. So nitrogen and two oxygens make no charge. Which element is more electronegative, nitrogen or oxygen? Which element is the most electronegative? No, no, of, of all of the elements. Of all the elements, which one's the most electronegative? Oxygen is the second most electronegative. Point. Yeah. So the noble gases aren't electronegative because they don't form covalent compounds. They don't have any need to bond. So it becomes a matter of charge and size. Boring has the most want for charge because it's the closest to a noble gas configuration. And it's the smallest, so that charge is the most compacted, which makes it the most electronegative. By contrast, francium would be the least electronegative, way there on the bottom left corner, because it has neither want nor desire for electrons. And it's gigantic. So... When we're looking at non-metals, the one that is the most electronegative is the one that is going to dictate its charge to, the, uh, to everybody else. So oxygen is negative two because it's more electronegative. Its natural state is negative two. So its oxidation state is negative two. So two times negative two, it's four. 
for the nitrogen has to be positive four. Now, what about the ozone? What is the oxidation state for the oxygen in ozone? Still zero. It's the only element in that molecule, doesn't matter how many atoms there are, if it's uncharged, it's gonna have a zero state. For dinitrogen pentoxide, we're gonna do a similar thing, N2O5 equals zero. Two nitrogens plus five oxygens equals zero. Each oxygen is negative two, so two nitrogen minus 10 is zero. Follow my algebra, two nitrogen is equal to 10, which means nitrogen is equal to five. What about the oxygen in ozone heat, or uh, the oxygen in the oxygen molecule here? Still zero. So the question is, what is the oxidizing agent? Now, what does an oxidizing agent do? What is it? What is its purpose? It's not going to give away electrons away. It's going to take them. It's oxidizing something else. So what we want to look for in an oxidizing agent is reduction. So let's look at our possible candidates. Nitrogen is going from four to five. Is it being reduced? No, it's not being reduced. It's being oxidized. It's getting more positive. I'm going from positive four to positive five. I'm losing an electron, I'm not gaining. So the nitrogen is being oxidized, but it's not the oxidizing agent. The oxidizing agent is the ozone. What we want to think about, what we want to be careful of here is don't fall into the trap of looking at the ozone here and looking at the oxygen there and saying, oh, it didn't change. You're right. Most of it did not change. <laughs> but consider as reactive, we have three oxygens with no charge. On the product side, we only have two oxygens with no charge. Where did that third oxygen go? it went into the other compound. It got reduced in the process. That third oxygen is the one that got, ox that got reduced. And that makes ozone the oxidizing agent. Remember, oxidizing agents and reducing agents are always reactants. Not individual elements, but the whole reactant as a, as a group. Okay, so 
if you're trying to figure out the limiting reactant and, and the yield piece here, sometimes it's worth your effort to just kind of scan the entire question before you go about trying to answer it piece by piece. So the real key in this particular problem is understanding that at some point down the line here, I need to determine the theoretical yield and the percent yields of water. And so if I'm looking to save myself a little bit of time and some calculation effort, when I go to figure out what my limiting reactant is, the best case scenario for me is to use that theoretical yield to figure out what it is I need to have. So we we need to so we would start with balancing the equation. So once we've balanced the equation, the answer B, if we convert everything into grams of water, we'll basically kill two birds with one stone. <clears throat> we'll figure out what the limiting reactant is, and we'll also figure out the theoretical yield of water. <clears throat> so, the process we're going to do is we're looking at grams of reactant and we're going to turn it into grams of water in each case. So first we need to turn the grams into moles. 12.01 for carbon times four plus 1.01 for hydrogen times 10, 58.14 grams per mole. Grams cancel. For moles, we're turning, <clears throat> we're turning the butane into water. So moles of butane into moles of water. The numbers come straight from the balanced equation. 10 waters for two butanes. And then last step, we return the moles of water into grams. Molar mass of water is 18.02. .02. for oxygen, 1.01 .01 for each hydrogen. That's one that I feel like we work with enough that kind of just by just by sheer usage, we start to remember what it is. You do the same thing with a lot of the elements to use some of them so often it's just like okay yeah that's out that's out that's out you don't even need to look at the periodic table sometimes moles cancel out so one 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 five times ten times eighteen point oh two divided by fifty eight point one four divided by two four sig figs it's 1,728 grams of water. We're going to do the exact same calculation process with the oxygen now. Choose a different color here just for effect. 965 grams of oxygen. 
10 grams of oxygen in the moles. Oxygen 16. 16 times 2 is 32. Grams of oxygen cancel. Next, I need to turn the moles of oxygen into moles of water. Balanced equation gives me that. 10 waters for 13 oxygens. Finally, now you need to turn the moles of water into grams. Beauty of a limiting reactant problem, the, the last step is always the same, um, or at least it should be if we're doing it properly. If your last calculation isn't the same, that's usually a sign you're not doing it correctly. Because you're going to end up comparing things that aren't the same, and you're going to end up with erroneous conclusions. 18.02 grams per mole. So 965 times 10 times 18.02. 5 by 32, 5 by 13. We get 418 grams of water. No, no, because here's the thing. We've already done the calculation for it here. And so all that we really need to do is just finish out the problem. The limiting reactant is oxygen. Theoretical yield is 418 grams. And so I can take that 418 grams and just go straight down to letter D. And write my answer out because it's already been done. And I've already got the calculation work there to show. It. So no, you don't have to rewrite the whole thing again. That's one of the reasons why you do it this way. And so if you're intentional and you read the entire question before you start trying to work on the calculations, you can start to see, oh hey, I can I can actually answer two questions at the same time because I already, I, I'm going to have to do one of these things to answer the first one anyway. Why not have it be the thing that I'm looking for later on? Now to answer a question like C, there's a really simple process for doing that. If I take these two values and subtract them, that'll tell me the amount of excess water would have been expected, and I can work backwards to figure out basically just reversing this process to figure out how much extra of each influence. So 1728 minus 418. is 1310 grams of water. And then I just go backwards. 18.02 grams of water, one mole, 10 moles of water, two moles of butane, one mole of butane, the 58.14 grams. 
So I'm literally just taking that top calculation and just flipping it over. Everything that I multiply, I divide. Everything I divided, I multiply. And if I do that, times two, minus 58.14, Divide by 18.02, divide by 10, I get 845. Point three grams. And that's how much butane wasn't used since that part of the that part of the reaction didn't really. Right, any other questions with this uh, problem number four? Five C. Five C is just simple stoichiometry. Once you have this equation balanced, you're, you're literally just turning the grams of copper into grams of nitro, nitrogen dioxide. So it's just straight up stoichiometry, grams to grams, just like we did in module four. The 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 tricky one's part B because that's a solution stoichiometry question where what you need to do is, well, it's not a titration because we're going from grams to concentration. So I can't use the titration equation, but what I can do is I can turn the grams of copper into moles Turn the moles of copper into moles of nitric. Once I have the moles of nitric acid, so this is just stoichiometry right here. Once I have the moles of nitric acid, then I can use that volume to figure out the molarity. So, there are other units of concentration um, that you could theoretically pull up, but molarity would be the most straightforward given the data you have. Yeah, moles of solute divided by liters of solution is molarity. All right, number six is not a question that I'm going to ask you about. It's not something that you need to be concerned with. Um, it is a conversion question. Um, and it's one that used to be a higher focus. Hmm? This, this wouldn't be. How you would solve it is just recognizing the relationship between these two concentration units. So two molar HCl means I have two moles of HCl in one liter of solution. Mass percent would be grams of HCl divided by grams of solution times 100%.
with the density, it shouldn't be hard to figure out how these two are linked. If one liter is a thousand milliliters and my density is 1.16, then the mass of one liter of solution should be 1160 grams. Turn the moles of HCl into grams. I could use the molar mass. So with two pretty simple calculations, I have everything I need to convert. I would take the base to the division and multiply by 100 percent to get the percentage. So like I said, that won't be on the exam. It used to be something that we, um, uh, back when I did give this test, that was something that we focused on more was doing these inner conversions between concentration units. But we've moved off of that uh, because the, there are more valuable ways to spend our time than, than worrying about how to do these kinds of crossovers. All right, maybe one or two questions more. I'm sorry, let me move here. Mobile choice 13? Yeah. Am I looking at a different 13 than you have? Okay, so this one, the concentrated sulfuric acid question. Okay, so that is, well, we have that one. It's, um, well, it's the same key. What I did was we went through a curriculum restructuring uh, about a year and a half ago. And so a lot of the stuff that you're doing now in exam two used to be on exam three. So what I did is I took the same practice test, I just kind of chopped it up, and I didn't renumber the key because I figured you could, you could look at the question and match it to the key. Um, so the, the question is number six in the practice test. Okay. What we have to do is we have to remember our definitions. Solvent is the part of the solution that is present in the greatest amount. And so in this particular case, if only four grams out of every 100 are water, that makes the sulfuric acid, the H2SO4, the solvent rather than the solute. Water, because water is present in a far lesser amount than sulfuric gases. So ordinarily water would be the, the solvent, but in highly concentrated solutions, we have to be careful about those things. And so we should, this was more of a question of, do you know the definition of solvent? than do you know that water is usually a solvent? So the, this question was there kind of intentionally to see if you were paying attention to the question and if you knew the definition. So, so in the case of number six, 
H2SO4, the sulfuric acid, is the solvent because there are 96 grams of it and only four of the water. So, so the solvent's always the thing that's present in the greatest amount. The solute or solutes, depending upon how many things are dissolved, would be the other components. So in this particular case, with sulfuric acid being the solvent, that would make the water the solute. Okay, for electrolytes and non-electrolytes. What is the definition of an electrolyte? Okay, but what is it? It has to be a solution and it has to conduct electricity. So the questions become, what count? Well, a molten ionic compound, while it is liquid phase, it would be a strong electrolyte, not a weak one. Graphite, even though graphite is a conductor of electricity, is not an electrolyte because it's not liquid phase and it's not a solution. So finishing up number eight, we know that part C can't be true because acids exist and acids are molecular compounds that behave with electrolyte behaviors, whether they're strong and are strong electrolytes or are weak and weak electrolytes. Usually the two are somewhat linked. So if it has a really high pH or a really low pH, so if it's really basic or really acidic, that usually is an indicator that it's going to be a good electrolyte. For question number nine, what behaves as a weak electrolyte? We need to think about the other things that we classify as weak, a weak acid or a weak base. So we want to identify one of those two things. So, so right off the top of the bait, we can look at this and say none of these are acids. So uh, we can eliminate that as an option. Now we go into bases. The tricky thing here is that we have to remember that ammonia and other nitrogen-containing compounds have the capability of acting as a base if they're able to accept the protein. So if you've got nitrogen with a lone pair present on it, it's going to be able to accept that proton and act as a base. And when it does, it's going to be a base. So that's more of an experiential thing, just because in lab you should have seen in that conductivity lab, we used ammonia a couple of different ways, and every time it came out, barium hydroxide, yes, it's a group two hydroxide, but it's on the bottom half of the group. Those are considered strong bases. The other three are, are pure salts. For number 10, um, same kind of idea. We can eliminate A because A is an acid. We can eliminate C because we just talked about how ammonia is a weak base. So we're down to the hydroxides. And so it becomes a matter of where is it? 
group one, bottom of group two, that's what we're looking for. Group Bidians in group one, that's our strong base. So the exact reasoning we've never really discussed, um, but um, it has a, it has quite a bit to do with um, the activity or lack thereof of the ion with water. Uh, to, uh, so rubidium is not active toward water. It doesn't make an acid or a base with water. Iron does. Iron is weakly acidic in water. Aluminum is weakly acidic in water. All right, maybe one more. Can you do a question like number 11? Okay, so if we're trying to identify acids based on formula, that's exactly what we would do is we would look for the thing with hydrogen. We can't do that here. When we have, at, when we're looking for acids and bases in chemical reactions, we need to follow the proton. Where is the proton going? So now we have to remember our bronze two definitions. Acids are proton donors. So if we're looking for an acid, we're looking for something that is giving hydrogen away. Which one of these is giving hydrogen away? Well, you're right, it's water. What you want to do is you want to see if you can find the product that kind of is closely related to the reactant that you're interested in. So if I look at water and hydroxide, I realize water and hydroxide are only a hydrogen apart. And what's the difference? The water has one more hydrogen, which means that it must have lost a hydrogen. That, by definition, makes it an acid. Yeah. The ammonia, on the other hand, we can see that its relationship with NH4 plus is that it is a hydrogen apart as well. It has gained the hydrogen. Bases are proton acceptors. So the ammonia, the NH3 here is a base. So if we're looking at acid base behavior based on reactivity, just follow the hydrogen. Where does the hydrogen go? That's going to tell you what one's the acid and what one's the base. And again, just like when you're identifying oxidizing and reducing agents, it's going to be on the reactant side of the ledger. The, the products are irrelevant here because the reaction itself is unidirectional. If this was a reversible reaction, we could talk about the ammonium ion and the hydroxide ion acting as acid and base as well, but it's not. Since it's unidirectional, the acid and the base are going to be the acids. All right, I'm going to have to stop here because my my voice is about done. Um, but thanks for coming out, and certainly stop by tomorrow. I'll be in the learning lab in the afternoon.
if you have any more questions that come up, come feel free to come find me.